We arrived in Houston, Texas. Janie, my publicist, had a surprise for me. After that night's show, my boyfriend was coming to stay the night with me, Brandon St. John, professional wrestler. It was what they called a, a showman's. You see, I'd met Paul, or Brandon, as he's known to his fans, only six or seven times before. Janie's sister was a wrestling promoter and put us in touch with each other. Janie said that it would be good for my image. We had a few dates, but suddenly People Magazine was calling us 2020's most powerful super couple. I mean, what an accolade. Our six dates had already netted us millions as a couple. Despite this, we were actually attracted to each other, and it seemed to be working out so far. Brandon met me after the show. He had just won the Royal Rumble and was enjoying the publicity. Turning up at my show only amplified that. The press were rife. I left the stage after our encore and Brandon met me backstage. We walked the long walk to the dressing room, pursued by press. A strange older lady intercepted me en route. Her eyes were crazed and her hair was a mess. Do not look at the journalist outside, I beg you, she said. And with that, she turned and walked down the side corridor of the arena and then vanished. Mrs. Bolin, when are you and Mr. St. John making things official? One journalist asked. Do you want a baby, hon? Another asked. Brandon, how does it feel to be the Royal Rumble champion for 2020? Yet another one asked. Then, there he was. Stan. Standing there in a long trench coat with a notebook in his hand, like some old-time reporter just like he was dressed up for the part. Betty, honey, what message do you have for your number one fan? He asked. And I stopped walking, frozen in fear. The cameras then flashed. Where's Tony? I thought to myself. He was nowhere in sight. This is where you step in, Tony. You really are the worst bodyguard ever, I thought. Stan then stopped abruptly halting the crowd of journalists behind him. He shuffled two steps closer and was inches from my face. He said softly, Second chance to say yes to me. You don't want to regret this, honey. Brandon wasn't even fighting in my corner. He just stood there, staring deadpan into the distance. Have a look at my notes, Stan whispered excitedly, pushing his notebook forward with a maniacal grin on his face. He then fled. Light bulbs flashed all around me. I reluctantly thumbed through the notebook. It's not a scrapbook of images like last night. No. In some ways, it was a lot more stranger. It was a transcript. A detailed and brightly accurate word-for-word -word account of everything that I had said today since the time I woke up this morning. The strange older woman then appeared once again, behind the journalist, shaking her head in frustration. Paul slash Brandon and I returned to the penthouse, and within seconds he was shirtless. I'd been looking forward to this for weeks. I fixed us a double scotch. Then there was an urgent knock on the door. Brandon rolled his eyes, and went to go see who it was. Stan stooped in quickly, wearing a suit and carrying a gun. He marched straight over to the bedroom door, almost as if he already knew the layout of the room. Tony asked me to keep watch tonight, he announced, and took a seat by the bedroom door. Just pretend I'm not here, he said. No! Get out, you creepy little shit! I'm not having you sit outside our bedroom door Well, we're... It's cool, babe, Brandon said. He's just keeping us safe. What kind of man is okay with this? I thought. No, this is that crazy stalker, the one that I told you about. It is not okay. 
I want him out of here! I screamed. I then got a text from Janie. Have a good night's rest, hon. We'll get you at noon tomorrow. I frantically text back. He's here, in the room. Get Tony quickly. A red exclamation point appeared on the screen. The message had failed to send. I looked at Brandon, totally exasperated. I can't believe he doesn't care about Stan being here, I thought. This was the first alone time that we've had in months. Babe, honestly, it's fine, Brandon said. Just pretend he isn't here. Still uncomfortable with this whole situation, I went into the bathroom to freshen up a little bit. When I returned, Stan and Brandon slash Paul had switched places. Stan was on the bed, completely naked, and Brandon was sitting guard looking comatose. No reaction at all. No blinking. Is he even breathing? I thought. He looked dead to the world. I rushed over to check on him. Stan then smiled at me. He leaped up off the bed and lunged at me again with that same filthy gray handkerchief. He smothered my face once again. The room began spinning, and I passed out again. Wake up call for Mrs. Bolin! Wake up call for Mrs. Bolin! An unfamiliar voice said from out of nowhere. I bolted upright. Sunlight plowed through the floor-to-ceiling windows of the penthouse. I looked around. I was alone. No Stan. No Brandon. Not even a trace of them either. That's weird, I thought. My phone had died, and I had no idea what time it was. But I knew I had to get up and be ready by noon. I turned the TV on. Hollywood Bubblehead and gossip columnist Carly Carlson was on the screen, busting at the seams to release whatever inside scoop she had. In front of a huge crowd, she swung around to face the camera. Guys, I'm in Houston, Texas, and it's with a heavy heart that I report to you today that Paul D. Austin, known to his fans as, as WWE superstar Brandon St. John, was found dead at the age of 37 at the Metropole Hotel in downtown Houston. Consuela Gonzalez, a housekeeper at the hotel, found the sports star hanging in his room about 7.30 this morning. A note was found close to the body, which blamed his girlfriend, British rock star B.B. Bolin, as the reason behind his suicide. This is Carly Carlson for Inside Scoop. TMZ. Before I could even digest the news, Tim, Tony, and Janie all burst into my room, dressing me and pouring me into a car that was waiting outside. In Phoenix, Arizona, Janie, my publicist, had said to me, Sullivan Sachs, he's the CAO of the hottest new social media site. Janie, he's 24 years old, Ten years younger than me, I replied. It would be so hot, she insisted. Janie, my boyfriend's dead. Why don't you even care? I yelled. She shrugged it off as if we'd simply broken up. Not that he'd killed himself and blamed me. It wasn't a real relationship. You know that, right? She said. I don't buy his suicide note. Look, you know... That Stan was in this room, I began to say. No more details have been released, hon. You just need to get over it, she snapped. Look, I'm not ready for a new relationship right now, okay? I need to process everything that happened. This is really messed with my head, Janie, I responded. She did not care. Narrowing her eyes, pursing her lips... And peering into the distance, she tapped her chin, deep in thought. Hmm, come to think of it, you did sell more albums when you were single, she said. My phone then pinged. We need to get you ready for tonight, the message read from an unknown number. 
I knew exactly who it was, and I dreaded tonight's show. Janie left me, alone in my dressing room, an hour before the show. She's never left me alone before, I thought. My new makeup artist then entered the room. She smelled really bad. She looked a little odd. She looked at me in the mirror. Hello, honey. I'm thinking of a of a classic vintage Hollywood look tonight. You know, red lips, strong eyebrows, dramatic hair. She looked so familiar to me. She made up my face beautifully. My hair, however, was a different story. Leaning down slowly behind me and to my right, she looked at me in the mirror. She put a hand over her face and slowly pulled a prosthetic mask, revealing herself to be none other than Stan. He grinned at me like a cat that caught the cream. I gasped. But before I could move, he aggressively slapped handcuffs on my right wrist, locking me to the bar under the chair arm. Then he did it again with a new pair on my left wrist. He smiled and snickered like a lunatic looking directly at me in the mirror. He slowly began to shave my head. My thick, luscious, platinum blonde locks dropped pathetically to the floor as he transformed my long Barbie doll hair into a short shaved crop. I squirmed and ducked in the chair, desperately trying to escape the clippers. Pain filled my nose and my throat as I started to cry. My beautiful long hair. All these things that made me famous he was taking away from me. First, my musical knowledge, my breast implants, my A-list boyfriend, and now my hair. When he finished, he announced proudly, Ta-da! Gone was the sexy alter ego that I spent years creating. I looked as deranged as Stan did. If I can't have you, then no one else can, he declared with a cocky and arrogant smirk. And now, he sung, smiling at me in the mirror. Then he spun me around to face him. It's showtime, he said. There was no extra time. The opening act had been done for 35 minutes. Opening the dressing room door, he sprinted at brickneck speed through the backstage corridors, pushing me in the chair, manically laughing over and over and over again, whooping and cheering and staring at me. Arriving at the stage with great speed, so much that I couldn't process what was happening, he released the handcuffs, yanked me up by the back of my shirt, swung my guitar across my shoulder, and shoved me forwards toward thousands of waiting fans. I staggered on stage to a fastly decreasing applause, completely bald.